Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, it's always good to get in front of some of the folks that contribute some of this data for us. So this is um, the third year or fourth year now of the diet study that's been going on um, over the last several. Matt presented some data from previous diet studies that were uh, uh, that were occurring on Lake Michigan, and this is over the most recent several years. Um, it's, it's really important to point out that certainly I'm centered at Michigan State, but we rely on a lot of different collaborators, including Matt Cornis and the Fish and Wildlife Service in particular, um, to collect some of the diets for this study. But there's a number of other people that, that are involved in, in collecting this diet. It's a, it's a fairly substantial undertaking to collect diets from both Lake Huron and Lake Michigan simultaneously. And it requires really great collaborators to, to help us do that. So if this is the first time that you've seen this talk, I thought it would be helpful to kind of reiterate some of our project goals. And so one of the main things, of course, is to determine species specific diets for predators in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, as well as walleye in Lake Huron. They're, they're not quite as abundant in most of the places where we're sampling in Lake Michigan. In addition, um, two other aspects that are important is to kind of parse out some of that diet data that say Matt presented to look at the seasonal as well as spatial trends and heterogeneity or, or differences in diet composition that we know exists, but um, perhaps you know, we can elaborate on that uh, a little bit better. And then lastly, we know that um, there's a potential for those diets that are collected from fish that were caught by anglers to be biased. And the reason for that um, is that um, anglers maybe tend to catch fish that are hungry um, or for whatever reason, um, there may be some differences in, in the diets from angler caught fish versus those caught say in surveys in, in gill nets or trawls at the bottom or um, from those stabilized isotopes that such as those that, that Matt presented. So just as a little bit of progress, uh, COVID-19 halted almost all diet collection and analysis uh, throughout 2020. In particular, really delayed the analysis of those stomachs that were collected in 2019. Um, usually we finished those up say in April or May, and we weren't able to finish those until November of 2020, um, which is, you know, that's just the way it goes, I guess. Um, one of the things that we're really proud of on this project is, is the creation of a database where we can fairly easily access um, all, all the diets in a, in a relatively organized fashion. And oddly enough, the program that we're using is called Access, right? Makes sense. Uh, in addition, uh, we do have some results from the predator stabilized isotopes, um, but we're still waiting to vet those and place them in context. You saw that Matt placed his predator stabilized isotopes in context of prey fish, and we would like to do the same. I'm sorry, for some reason, I think this slide shows on a timer, so it may flip back and forth occasionally. Um, and then this project at least technically ends um, at the end of this year. So uh, next year will likely be the last time you'll see uh, an update uh, unless something changes with, with funding. So just to give you an idea of the amount of effort that we've been spending um, collecting stomachs. So these represent the total sam stomach samples uh, on each lake that we've collected on the year uh, by year. And in 2020, because things were so delayed in 2019, um, we're still working through 2020. Um, that is a phantom laser pointer. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, so in any case, um, we've gotten over 13,000 stomachs collected total in our database, and that includes all species. Sometimes we get things like yellow perch and lake whitefish in our, in our database that we don't know about until after we've entered the data. So including these uh, six focal species, salmonids, um, from Lake Michigan, 
Um, we've got a total of about 6,000 stomachs. And one of the things that I want you to notice is kind of where, in some cases, where sample sizes are a little bit lower. And so um, some places in, in uh, northern Michigan, as well as some places in Wisconsin, it's a little bit lower. In addition, uh, one of the things that we're really struggling to do is to get diets in fall and winter. And that's not necessarily a surprise, right? Like there's less effort, um, but we know people are fishing. Um, and one of the ways that I know people are fishing, because I've been on Lake Huron in November, and uh, you can see here those fish right there. Those are the fish that I actually donated to the project. So I know people are fishing. Um, it's just a matter of getting those stomachs. So just to summarize, um, in the database here, we have well over 13,000 um, from 12, uh, 2012 total. We got some older stomachs from previous years. Um, but there are some gaps in species space and time. So certain species we have difficulty catching as well. Things like brown trout um, and sometimes steelhead. So just to give you an idea, I would like to place the Lake Michigan uh, diet content in, in context. And uh, I'd like to put Lake Huron up first to show that. And what we see is there's all these colors here and just to orient you to the, to the graphs here, on the y-axis, we have the proportion of the diet. So from zero to one, so this one would be 100%, zero would be 0%. And, um, and, and so when we look at these species, we can see things like uh, walleye consume a lot of brown goby, whereas um, things like steelhead eat a lot of uh, invertebrates. And in particular, as Matt highlighted, those tend to be uh, terrestrial invertebrates. This is on Lake Huron again. Lake trout um, tend to eat a lot of gobies, um, not surprisingly. And when they're not eating gobies, they tend to eat smelt or sometimes this fish category, that's just all other fishes. Um, so cyprinids, uh, minnows, etc. cetera. Whereas Chinook salmon, you can see, even though there aren't a ton of alewife in Lake uh, Huron, they still manage to find them. And we're not exactly sure why that is. Most of the Chinook salmon that we catch in our survey uh, or that we get in our um, stomach samples tend to come from very northern Lake Huron. And so um, we're not exactly sure whether that just means that there's higher ill life there. We think that's the case. Uh, but certainly we, we observe more ill life in Chinook salmon. In Lake Michigan, in contrast, everyone likes ale life. And so over the last three years, what we see is ale life dominating the stomach contents of just about everybody, with the exception perhaps of lake trout and to a secondarily degree brown trout. And so as you can see, um, from 2017, 2018, and 2019, there may be a slight increase in, in brown goby consumption by lake trout but uh, 2020 will, will help decide that. When we uh, look at these diets side by side, we can kind of see how they, they match up. And what we see for Chinook salmon in Lake Huron on top and Lake Michigan on bottom um, is that alewife are still really important. And when they're not eating alewife, they're eating rainbow smelt here in green. And although, um, um, Lake Michigan, um, each of these numbers represents the number of fish that we have. Um, the diet is overall about 98 to 99% alewife. Whereas on Lake Huron, that number um, has changed from 2017 to 2019, but it has seemed to increase, certainly. For lake trout, um, we see a, 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 a somewhat different story. In this case, um, in Lake Huron, uh, lake trout really like round gobies and up to 75 to 80% of their diet can be round gobies. In 2018, we saw fewer round gobies replaced by more rainbow smelt. And in 2019, we saw kind of a in between uh, 2017 and 2018 in terms of goby consumption. But one of the neat things that we are observing over the past three years is this kind of stepwise increase in, in rainbow, uh, sorry, in brown goby consumption as, as we've moved along. We'll, we'll see how that 
uh, if that continues in 2020, we're unsure. One of the nice things about the study is that we can now start to look at this diet uh, data, not only in terms of just annual summaries, but also in terms of, of, of how those diets change through time. And so in Huron, we can see that steelhead feed exclusively on, on, on invertebrates. Although our sample sizes are not super great, they still indicated a fairly dominant component of, of terrestrial invertebrates. And Lake Michigan, of course, we see air life being dominant, and that's by total biomass, like how much mass is in their stomach. But when we look seasonally, we see a somewhat different story. And what we see is that in spring months on Lake Michigan, we see air life comprising a relatively small portion of the diet, whereas invertebrates forming a, a much higher percentage. And as we go along in the year, we see uh, air life begin to dominate. Lake trout offer a similar contrast in terms of, of, of the timing of their consumption. So this is all just Lake Michigan here. And what we see is um, that in every single year that we've looked at data, there's this trend of um, decreasing round goby consumption as the year moves along. So each of these months here corresponds, of course, four is April, five is May, et cetera. And as we go from spring into summer, we see that air life become more and more important in lake trout diets. And when we pool all that data, that trend becomes really clear where um, in April, the, the majority of their diet is round gobies. And then that goes to about 50-50, say um, in, in May, lower in June, and then air life tend to dominate throughout the summer into fall. We can also look spatially, so across these different statistical districts. So just to orient you to this graph, um, each of these uh, names here represents a different statistical district. So MM2 is in the north, and so MM8 is in the south on the Michigan side of Michigan, and WM3 is on the Wisconsin side in the north and going towards the south there. And one of the interesting things that we've um, that we've discovered, at least given the diet data that we have now, is that most of the goby consumption in lake trout occurs on the Michigan side of Lake Michigan. And we're not exactly sure why that is. Um, according to our diet data that we have entered in the database right now, um, goby are nearly absent from the Wisconsin side of Lake Michigan, but tend to be pretty abundant over on the Michigan side. Uh, because this is a talk on Lake Michigan, I thought I'd talk about what we're finding in terms of the relationship between air life and, and, and predators in, in the lake. And one of the things that we can do by looking at these stomach contents is look at those prey and actually conduct measurements to determine what sizes there are. And this gives us an idea of, say, the, the overall um, range of air life sizes that these predators are consuming. And if we look at all these different predators, and the sizes of gobies that we're finding in the diets, what we see is that um, it, they're pretty much eating the same size alewife. In 2019, it's sorry, it's a little bit diverse, more diverse, but certainly um, in 2017 and 2018, um, and to slightly less degree, 2019, they're, they're pretty much eating the same size goby. Um, in 2020, we have very little data. This represents about 44 alewife total. Um, but one of the things you've probably noticed at this point is that the size of this kind of peak area of, of ill life sizes is, is moving to the right. And so what we did then is kind of pool all those predators. We put them all together to get a more clear picture of what size of ill life are being consumed by all predators. And what we see is, is a single peak. And what that means essentially is that all these predators essentially are focusing on one size of air life with a little bit of variation um, in a given year. And what we see is these peaks are moving slowly to the right. So say about 100 millimeters in 2017, that's, you know, yay big. <laughs> uh, and as we go to 2019, 
that has increased to about 150. But it's generally increasing and it's generally a single peak indicating probably they're feeding on a single year class of alewife. Nonetheless, um, certainly our research data uh, or our data has highlighted some of these trends in terms of, of the predator diets. Um, but we have lots and lots of questions regarding uh, lake trout. Um, and in particular, we want to know what's going on in Wisconsin. Uh, we're not exactly sure, right? Why are they not consuming gobies in Wisconsin when they do clearly in both Lake Huron and on, on the Michigan side? Uh, of Lake Michigan. And one of the things that's been suggested to us in previous uh, workshops is that this may be due to fishing strategy. Um, folks on the Michigan side tend to target lake trout on the bottom in springtime. And it may be that those lake trout that they're catching are very bottom oriented and consuming lots of gobies. Whereas, um, and maybe that's not the case on, on the Wisconsin side. One of the contrasts, of course, um, not only in terms of spatially, but also temporally, right? Like there's this trend of, of increasing air life consumption uh, throughout the year. And that may be entirely due to the appearance of Chinook salmon, uh, where anglers switch strategies from fishing near the bottom to switching kind of higher up in the water column. And therefore, we may see um, kind of a switch based on, on just how anglers are, are fishing. We can perhaps compare Lake Michigan to Lake Huron, where there's certainly fewer Chinook. Um, and, and maybe anglers are more likely to target um, lake trout on the bottom. And then when, so when we look at lake trout um, in Lake Huron throughout the year, we do see sort of a similar trend, right? Um, where gobies are high in the springtime, they kind of decrease throughout the summer. But one of the things that's kind of a thinking moment for me is, well, oh, there's this alewife signal here, right? Light blue is alewife. And that indicates that a significant number of our samples are likely coming from the only place in Lake Huron where we see alewife, and that's way up in the north in MH1. And guess what else is up in MH1? Chinook salmon. And so it may be that there's a similar switch in strategies in that area from targeting lake trout to targeting Chinook. So the mystery still kind of exists. Another perhaps piece of data that we could look at is, uh, again, to get at this idea of angler biases by comparing the capture methods. And so in Lake Michigan, we did that by comparing those fish caught by angling via those caught with a bottom gill net. So a gill net set on the bottom. And what we see is in fact, higher round goby caught in those bottom gill net fish as compared to angling in all three years in which we've collected diet data. And so what this indicates is that the diet data that I've been showing you, which is dominated by those fish that were captured by angling, may not necessarily be telling the entire story of these diets, in particular for lake trout. Because they are flexible in their foraging, as Matt indicated, they may be um, more flexible even than perhaps that diet uh, that stabilized isotope shows. Another component that we're looking at is how, how best to use this data. And this data is looked at um, and used by those modelers, as, as, as Matt talked about, to help I, get us an idea. Um, and Kelly, Dr. Robinson, will, will talk about this a little bit later. What, what is the best stocking strategy? And that, that modeling strategy is informed by, of course, what those predators are eating. And so one of the things that this study hopes to resolve is the best way to use this data given what we know about the variation in diets associated with both space and time. So in terms of next steps, we are analyzing those 2020 stomachs as fast as we possibly can. Um, my lab is currently pretty restricted in terms of how many, how many hours and people can, can work in the lab at one time. And as a result, processing those stomachs is slower than it has been in years past. 
We're really excited about the isotope data coming in. And next year, if I'm invited back, um, I can certainly put those diet contents in, in perspective uh, of the isotope data and to do a direct side-by-side -side comparison, similar to what Matt did. In addition, we've already started collecting more stomachs, but we're always looking for more. Um, and so even though the current project ends uh, at the end of this year, um, we're still looking for diets to come in this year. And to hopefully help with that, one of the things that we've done is kind of change our strategy. So one of the, some of the feedback that we got back from anglers um, is that it was difficult to kind of fill out the data tag associated with the stomach. So it was kind of a pain to extract the stomach. It was an additional pain to fill out the data form. And I know I'm an angler, right? Your hands are all bloody. Uh, it's kind of a pain in the butt to, to get out a pencil and fill out the data sheet. And so we've altered these data sheets so that they're much easier. Now, essentially, it'll be a pull tag where you can use a knife or a paper clip or whatever you want to punch when you're fishing, where you're fishing, what species, and uh, within a half inch, the length of that fish. And that's the data that we need to be able to provide the analysis, analyses that we provided today. And so what we're asking is, yes, it would be great if you could give us really, really precise data, but what would be even nicer is if we can get more stomachs. And so what we're hoping is that folks will, will contribute more stomachs. And um, these are appearing um, in various locations with freezers. And so take next time you go out, catch some fish, go to the cleaning station, keep an eye out please for, for this sign that you see here, as well as the, the data tags. It should be a lot easier to fill out. And all you gotta do essentially is either extract the stomach, if you don't wanna do that, you can even just give us the entire bunch of entrails um, and, and we'll even take that. Um, and put it in a bag, put it in the freezer, done. And so what we're really hoping is that uh, we can get much higher participation from those volunteer anglers. In addition, if you, if you wanna put these at your local cleaning station, contact me, um, my information is here. And, um, and I can certainly send you out a bunch of bags and tags and whatever else you would need to, to help us increase our sample sizes um, throughout, throughout the summer and into fall and winter. Um, with that, thank you.